so we've just seen the definition of factor ability. And now we're going to look at how we can use this definition and uh, 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 from it, we can make some connections to this principle that's called Occam's razor. How many people have encountered this phrase Occam's razor before? It's a very old concept. Uh, it shows up in pretty much every school of philosophy. Uh, it's called Occam after that guy there, William. Uh, and the idea is uh, if you have some phenomenon that occurs in nature, uh, you prove, and there are multiple explanations for the same phenomenon, prefer the simpler phenomenon over the more complex ones. Why? There's a bias. Uh, there's no reason that nature should prefer the simpler phenomenon over the complex one. This is just a preference that uh, different schools of philosophy, and as we will see, uh, pack learning also enforces. It's a, it's a widely prevalent idea. There's a Latin phrase that I'm not going to pronounce that basically says, don't lose Posit plurality without necessity. Don't make a don't come up with a complex explanation for any phenomenon unless the data demands it. And we'll see that uh, this is uh, going to show up in our theorem. Let's uh, let's uh, try to build it up. So consider the following situation. Suppose we have a classifier, a learning algorithm that is given a data set. And that learning algorithm produces a classifier that is perfectly um, agreeing with every single label in the training set. Okay, so we are going to call uh, a, a, a classifier, a model that agrees with a training set. We're going to call it a consistent training set. And you're going to call a, a learning algorithm a consistent learner if it always produces a consistent classifier. Have you seen a consistent learner before? Which one? Easy Why is it consistent? You have a deputy, it's a branch. What will the training error of the of a tree that produces the, the ID3? Suppose ID3 algorithm produces a tree. What will its training error be? Zero. Because provided the data set does not contradict itself, ID3 will always produce a tree that is consistent. That's what I mean by consistent learner. The learner always produces a classifier whose labels are guaranteed to be correct on the training data. Another consistent learner is a learner that takes a training set, puts it in a database, and just returns. And when a new example is presented, it checks, is this example in my database? If so, return the true label. If not, just toss a coin. Also a consistent learner, right? A consistent learner need not necessarily be a good one. So the question is, what could make a consistent learner fail? One way in which it might fail is if the training set is not a representative sample of the instance space, then your the hypothesis that your learner produces could be bad, even though it's consistent with many, many examples. It could be bad just by accident, right? If your training set is not representative. So let's see, let's try to quantify when this might happen. Let's quantify the probability of this bad situation happening. The bad situation is your training set is not representative of the instance space, and uh, your hypothesis produces a consistent classifier. And then we'll ask. This is a bad situation. What will it take for us to make the probability of this bad situation low? This is the game we are going to play. Before I move on, are there questions? Because from now on, I'm going to just go through a couple of theorems. Looks like you're ready for math. So let's first start off with a small a claim, a lemma. The probability that there's a hypothesis, H, that is consistent with M training examples and yet has generalization error more than epsilon 
is less than this quantity. I'm not going to read out that quantity. You can uh, read it yourself. But the claim is the probability that there's a hypothesis that's consistent with all those examples and yet has managed to fool us is less than this example. No, less than this number here. Yes? Consistent means 100% accuracy. On the training set. On, on With those examples. It doesn't have to be training set. Consistent means it makes the, is correct with, uh, gives the correct label on all, all those examples. Mm -hmm. So basically what this is saying is, um, this assumes that this, uh, this unit here today, we are, when we, when I say Occam's razor, I'm assuming consistency. Later on, we'll deal with an Occam's razor that gives up this consistency part, but I just wanted to clarify that. So the situation here is we have a hypothesis H that gives you the correct label on M different examples. And yet this hypothesis has poor generalization error, meaning the generalization error is more than epsilon. So it's consistent and yet bad. And the claim here is that the probability that happens, this situation happens, is less than the size of H times one minus epsilon power F. Mm. Let's prove this. Let's say that we have some hypothesis H that is consistent and yet bad. But before that, let's say that we just have a hypothesis that has that is bad. I define uh, bad as has a generalization error more than epsilon. Mm. Remember that the generalization error is the probability that on a randomly chosen example from the true distribution, the probability that your uh, the hypothesis disagrees with the true function f. Right? So the probability that this particular classifier uh, hypothesis h is gives you so first of all i said that h is h is a bad hypothesis it has an error more than epsilon but that doesn't mean that it cannot just by accident give you the right label on some example right it could give you the right label so that it, it's possible that it, its error is more than epsilon but it's also possible that uh, the uh, it, the hypothesis accidentally got the right label What's the probability that this hypothesis gets the right label on some examples? If the probability that it gets the wrong label is more than epsilon. One minus that. So the probability that H is consistent with one example is less than one minus epsilon. By chance. Like it, it, it could happen by chance, right? But look at the statement up there. Look at point number one in the claim. This hypothesis is not consistent with one example, but it's consistent with m different examples. That's the that's part of the input that's given to us. This this hypothesis is a bad hypothesis, and yet it's consistent with m different examples. If it's consistent with one example, the probability that it might happen is less than one minus epsilon. If it's consistent with two examples, randomly chosen, the probability that it's accidentally consistent with both of them is yeah. one minus epsilon square, it's less than that. Yeah. If it's consistent with three examples, yeah. Q. Yeah. You see where this is going. The probability that the hypothesis is consistent with M examples, all of them drawn independently from the true distribution, is going to be less than one minus epsilon power M. Just to kind of put some numbers here, if epsilon is 0.1, 1 minus epsilon is 0.9. 1 minus epsilon square is 0.81. So we have 0 0.9, 0 0.81, 0 0.729. And then after that, I can't do the math in my head. Mm -hmm. So the number gets smaller and smaller and smaller very, very quickly. These are, you, you're multiplying numbers between 0 and 1 again and again. Any questions so far? What we have shown, talked about is one hypothesis accidentally being consistent with uh, M examples, despite being bad overall, despite its true error being more, more than epsilon. Questions? Yes? That seems like the highest probability. High or low? Low. Which one? Um, Are you talking about this? Yeah, we only have like one example. 
Yeah. 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 Yeah.
the claim is being the claim is very very specific. The claim is the probability that exists such a hypothesis is less than the size of h times one minus epsilon. For that, we are not even talking about the learner actually picking that hypothesis. Maybe the hypothesis exists and the learner just lets it go. Yes. So for a small epsilon and small uh, and an i i a. We could have a guaranteed probability that there is a because this number might actually be more than one. Yeah, that's right. This is the situation. Just to kind of uh, thing roll things back, I'm not going to go into the details of the union bond. This is I, I want you to kind of if you've not seen the union bond before or if it seems like the union bond is not very Familiar, I encourage you to look it up. It probably shows up in uh, maybe discrete math or introduction to probability type classes. Uh, because I do want to, uh, but the, the, the point is, we will be appealing to the union bound a few times through the semester. And the key I, intuition here is, if you have a set of events and each of them has some probability of occurring, the probability that at least one of the set happens is less than the sum of the individual probabilities. That's the union bond. And that's what's happening here. This point here, the let's call this, the proof has three steps, A, B, and C. Step B says there is, or step A and B together are talking about one hypothesis being bad. The probability of one hypothesis being bad and yet consistent. That's the event in question. How many hypotheses do we have? We have the entire hypothesis space. And so step C is saying probability that at least one of the hypothesis in hypothesis in the hypothesis space is bad. And that is less than the sum of these this quantity taken m times, sorry, taken size of h times. And that's why you get size of h times one minus epsilon so on. Yeah. So how do we know the size of x? That kind of seems like the have of the Yes, that's a very, very good observation. Notice that the key point here is size of x. How do we know the size of x? Well, for certain classes of functions, we can actually compute the size of x, just like we did for Hubble. And the size of x, once again, shows up as a natural sort of a complexity parameter here. But we're not done here. Uh, uh, we're not done because all we have here is that this is a bad situation. This is a situation that there is some hypothesis that is consistent with M examples and yet is bad. So if you have a learner that, like ID3, that just says, I'm going to try to find a classifier that is consistent with the entire training set and hope it generalizes. Well, this uh, statement says, it's possible that this situation can uh, backfire because the con if, there might be a classifier that's consistent with the training data and yet, is bad because it has generalization error more than epsilon, and the probability that it happens is less than this quantity here, right? This is a bad situation. What we would like to do is we need we're going to try to see what does it take to make this quant this probability low. Now imagine that that quantity there. So let me write this. We have probability of consistent. Hypothesis get bad is less than size of h times one minus epsilon power f. This is what uh, is written up there. Mm -hmm. Now suppose I mean I'm able to guarantee to you that this quantity, this quantity here is less than some number. Let's call that number delta, a small number. If I can guarantee to you that the middle term there is less than delta, then the probability of having a consistent hypothesis that's bad is also going to be less than delta. Which means the probability of your learner failing is going to be small. And that's a good situation. So let's see what happens. What does it take? What, what do we require uh, to make this quantity small, smaller than delta, well, at least if this quantity is smaller than delta, then this is going to be smaller than delta. So let's formalize this and take this uh, to its conclusion. We want to make 
this situation rare. We want to make its probability smaller than delta. So instead of making the probability of the whole thing, that, that instead of explicit directly saying this should be less than delta, I'm going to say this type of H times one minus epsilon power M is less than delta. If that happens, then the situation that we don't like, namely we have a consistent hypothesis that it's bad, is going to be improbable if delta is small, of course. Mm -hmm. Now, we are done with all the sort of intuitive arguments, all the tricky parts here. All that's left now is algebra. All we need to do now is just reorganize this whole expression. So I can take log on both sides. So let me just work that through. So I can take log of the size of h plus m log 1 minus epsilon is less than log delta. I've taken log on both sides and just applied the properties of logarithms. This should not come as a surprise to any of you. If it does, then I'm concerned. Okay. So I've taken log and once again, the, the, the situation is if delta is small, the probability that we have a consistent and a bad hypothesis will also be small because of this inequality here. So let's um, reorganize this a little bit. Importantly, I know that uh, here I'm taking log is uh, um, log to the base e, so natural logs. So I know that uh, e power x for small x, uh, sorry, e power minus x is 1 minus x plus minus other things. And importantly, um, based on this, I can also, I can take log on both sides. And I know that uh, I, if I take log of, so this means minus x is going to be strictly greater than log one minus x because I'm, I'm essentially truncating this whole part here yeah. and taking the log. Mm -hmm. So essentially what I'm doing is e power x is more than one minus x. Mm -hmm. And if I take the log on both sides, I can apply, I can basically say that this quantity is less than log size of h minus m epsilon. This quantity is less than that because of... Did I get this thing wrong? Reversed. I got it reversed. reversed. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. It, uh, it's not true. Yeah, yeah. If, so that, uh, yeah, the, instead of that, suppose I had a situation where instead of this being true, I had log size of h plus m minus m epsilon was less than log delta. Suppose this was true. If this was true, then this is true. Why? It's even smaller. So this is actually a weaker condition. Log of 1 minus epsilon is less than, is, is going to be even less than minus epsilon, so it fits here. Oh. So if this were true, then the thing about mm -hmm. it just so happens that the thing at the bottom is easier to work with, and that's what we'll be playing with. But oh. this is a it's not a tricky arm, it's not a car. So I'm, I'm not pulling a trick here, it's just uh, I'm loosening the requirement. Rather than saying that um I'm going to work with that, which is actually sufficient, I'm just kind of uh, going to reorganize this and make it expression in terms of one one over epsilon and one over delta as we saw before. Mm -hmm. So if I had log of one minus epsilon, um, okay, I, I've kind of skipped a few steps here. So if log of size of h minus m epsilon is less than del well, log delta, then log of size of h plus m times log one minus epsilon will also be less than log delta. Now let's kind of take this and uh, make this a little bit 
So I started off with size of H plus times one minus epsilon power M. I want this to be less than delta. I took log on both sides. So log size of H plus M log one minus epsilon is less than log delta. But I, if we have, let's call this equation one or inequality one, log size of H minus M epsilon. If this were true, then one holds. Why? Because I know that minus epsilon is is bigger than log one minus epsilon. And so I can multiply both sides by M. And then I can multiply, I can add a log size of H here. And I can add a log size of H. And I know from one, but that I know from here that this is less than log delta, which means this holds. Yeah. So does this make sense? Yes. Okay. But one person said yes. Mm -hmm. uh, should I take that as a given for everyone or? Yes. Uh, what are you uh, trying to achieve? What am I trying to do here? That's a good point. So let's actually get to what I want to do. So let's get rid of all of this. So let's take this expression and reorganize this. So I'm going to put m epsilon greater than log delta plus log size of h. It's the same thing, right? That means epsilon greater than log size of h plus, I'm going to make it likely sorry, m. If m was more than 1 over epsilon times that expression there, then this, this, all of these are the same. If this were true, then one is true. If one is true, then the thing on top is true. Did you have a question? Are you missing is it? Oh. Where am I missing a negative here? Oh, here, right? Yeah. Yes, thank you. Okay, now, now it looks more familiar to me. Thank you. This is the nice thing about doing math uh, on a slide. There's like a reasonable chance of getting it wrong. And uh, that that also means that uh, people can catch it and hopefully that uh, that's good. So yeah, this, this is actually more correct. If you have these many examples, just kind of, all I've done here is symbol manipulation, but let's kind of, stare at these symbols and think about what they mean because that's more important. Uh, there's a question. Does the, oh, there was a question on about quite a while back. Does the final inequality work? It's a worst case exam. Yeah, basically the, the, the question is long. I'm not reading it, but Alan, your, your, situ, your uh, uh, intuition is correct. So M is the number of examples. What I'm saying here is if the number of examples were more than 1 minus epsilon times log size of h plus uh, log 1 over delta, then this situation holds. If that situation holds, then this situation holds. The size of h times 1 minus epsilon power m will be less than delta. But if the size of h times 1 minus epsilon power m is less than delta, then the probability of having a consistent and yet uh, bad hypothesis is also going to be less than delta. So learning the probability that learning fails is low. The probability that learning succeeds is more than that. And what do we have here? The number of examples is more than just this quantity here. Is if we have sufficient number of examples that is polynomial in one over epsilon, it's also polynomial in one over delta. And the only complexity parameter that really matters is the log of the size of the hypothesis. If that quantity is polynomial in the dimensionality for some hypothesis space, then learning will succeed. 
let's kind of uh, uh, revamp, uh, go back up. If m is greater than 1 minus epsilon log size of uh, hypothesis plus log 1 over delta, then the probability of getting a bad hypothesis is small. In other words, if this situation happens, if the number of examples was in of this quantity, then the size of h times log one minus epsilon, times one minus epsilon power m will be less than delta. If that happens, then the bad situation, namely we have a classifier that is consistent with m examples and yet has a high generalization error, becomes improbable. So what do we need? We have, if, if I can prove that I have these many examples and I have a consistent learner, learning with high probability is going to succeed, but I need these many examples. Why is this called an Occam's razor? We have six minutes left. So before I, uh, let me take 30 seconds for questions. About this process. Oh, uh, as you're thinking of questions, I do want to say, I've said this before, the absolute worst way to learn anything mathematical is to watch someone else do math. The only way to get this is for you to actually do it yourself. So please just work through the material by yourself, you know, try to uh, build the step, you know, try to kind of get the intuition and the reason for the sequence of steps being correct. Um, who knows, maybe I'm lying to you. Maybe I've set up the slides to convincingly pull off a trick. Then it turns out that uh, everything here is a lie. So please, please work through this here. I'll go to your first and then you. Yeah. Um, I'll come back to your question because that's the top, that's the next thing that I'm going to talk about. Yes. Um, do, do I understand it correctly that the probability that running fails is proportional to the size of your hypothesis space? If in this case, so if that is maybe, maybe it's just in this case, but if that's true, like how do we succeed learning in a giant infinite hypothesis? Oh, that's a that's an excellent question. Uh, I thought you were going somewhere else with that, but. Um, that, the answer to that will come after the spring break. Okay. Um, like perceptron, yeah. does not work here. So the, the answer to that is we have to redefine the notion of the size of a hypothesis space. Okay. From taking it from just counting the number of functions to something more fun and cool. That cool in a certain in certain words. Uh, uh, but to answer your question, it's kind of related. The probability that learning fails is related to the size of the hypothesis space. Which means if you want your learning to succeed, make the search space small. Consider only fewer explanations. And here simplicity is the number of explanations you consider. So this what we have here is an this, all Occam's razor theorems take this form. Let H be some hypothesis space. And what we really proved is an Occam's razor theorem. Let H be some hypothesis space. Then the probability one minus epsilon. A hypothesis H that is consistent with a training set of size M will have a generalization error less than epsilon on all future examples, provided the number of examples we have is more than one over epsilon times log sine of H plus log one over delta. I just proved this thing. Basically, what I'm saying here is if you have a learner that always gives you a consistent classifier, like your ID3, and it uh, it is given M examples. And it op it searches over a certain fixed hypothesis space. Then the probability that your cla classifier, which has given you a consistent class, uh, 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 sorry, your learner, which has given you a consistent classifier, the probability that its generalization error will be bad, and bad is defined by you by choosing a certain epsilon. It's the probability that its future error will be more than epsilon is going to be low, and uh, in particular the your learner will succeed with probability one minus delta, where delta is basically the probability your learning fails. So let's kind of tease this apart. Epsilon is your error. Suppose I want low error. If I want low error, that means epsilon gets smaller and smaller. 
If I demand that my classifier is going to be accurate, then I need to pay the price by increasing the sample complexity, the number of examples that I need. M is the sample complexity by the way. So in order to get a better error, you need to pay the price by creating a larger training set. If you have a larger hypothesis space, then learning becomes, it's harder to show that learning will succeed. You need more training examples to justify searching a larger hypothesis space. So you have to pay the price. And this time it is log of size of H. So it, in, it uh, grows logarithmically with the size of the hypothesis. And the third one, if you want a higher class confidence that your learner succeeds, then you have to pay the price. You have to pay, you have to uh, produce, you have to have a larger training set because to get that extra confidence, confidence, you need more examples. So that grows logarithmically in one over delta. Delta is uh, the probability that your learning fails. Mm -hmm. So delta becoming smaller is your con your confidence in the learning getting higher. Mm -hmm. Let's uh, uh, very briefly for a minute, this is called an Occam's razor because it uh, expresses a preference for smaller hypothesis space. Mm -hmm. Imagine that your learner uh, is able to find a consistent hypothesis with only, imagine that you have a, a million examples and your learner searches through a hypothesis space consisting of three examples. And it finds a function that perfectly classifies all million of them. Wouldn't it be an extremely improbable situation that this, your classifier is the wrong one? Alternatively, imagine that you have a million functions and you have 100 examples. You, you can, you, with high likelihood, you'll find some function that perfectly explains all 100 of them. This is called Occam's razor because it expresses a preference not for smaller functions, but for smaller search spaces. Searching over a fewer hypotheses and finding the one that's perfectly agreeing with your data is an unlikely event. And if it actually happens, then it's, pro it's not an accident, sure. especially if you have a lot of examples. That's really what the theorem says. Larger hypothesis spaces are not necessarily bad. It's just that simpler hypothesis spaces are unlikely to fool us by being consistent with a large number of examples. It's also life lessons there uh, about uh, searching for explanation. Why? Why the simpler ones are unlikely to fool us? Because of that theorem. All right, I'll stop here. Uh, in the next lecture, I'm going to take this theorem. What we'll do is we'll apply this to actual examples and see what this actually means.